Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to this morning's session. Um, don't bother implementing Data Lake if you're not ready. We've got some great uh, lineup of CTOs here uh, with us this afternoon. Um, data Lake projects, often presented as the holy grail to manage data. However, the failure rate is high, and that's probably because companies are not ready to implement such data management framework. So what are the pitfalls to avoid? How do you get your company ready? What resources and skills are needed? These are just some of the key things that our panel today will be discussing. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, Rajesh Jethwa, he's Chief Technical Officer of Digiteri. Hopefully I got pronounced that right. Mm -hmm. uh, Barry Gould, CTO Concord Resources Limited, and Carl Austin, UK CTO for BJSS. So wonderful to have you uh, here this afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And um, so this afternoon, or this morning, depending which time zone you're in, I'm getting confused, um, on planet Earth here at least, uh, that's for sure. Uh, you know, we're looking at um, a couple of key points. Uh, you know, what actually, what, what do we mean by a data lake? Uh, there's probably a few of us, including myself, who's wondering the difference between data oceans, data lakes, and data streams. Um, Rajesh, do you want to kick off, maybe? Yeah, why not? Uh, good morning, Tom. Good morning, everybody else, and good afternoon, depending on the time zone that you're in. Um, yeah, very good to start with definitions, because because data lake and some of its predecessors, like data marts and data warehouses, have have become quite broad in their meanings and, and severely overloaded. Um, I guess the main, uh, the main metaphor that we're dealing with here in terms of an architectural pattern is really around a centralized data store of unstructured data. And that's how it differs from data warehouses, data marts, which suffered from a number of problems earlier, uh, things like information silos um, and an organization moving on and not getting meaningful data at the having static kind of structures of, of data. So in a broad sense, it's really a centralized uh, data store uh, of unstructured data. Okay. Ah, so structured and unstructured data there. Yeah, so uh, that's, uh, that's quite something. Um, yeah, Barry, what, uh, what do you think about data lakes? Yeah. Why should we uh, be interested in them? Indeed. So uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Um, let me give you a little bit of background about myself first. So Barry Gould, CTO of Concord Resources Limited. Um, we are a uh, metals trading company, uh, head office in London, offices in Hong Kong and New York. Um, I'm, I've been in technology for quite a while. You can probably see from my stubbly beard. Um, and I've worked in you know, investment banks. Um, I've even worked for the uh, UK government on some interesting projects. Um, I mentor a number of internet startup companies. So, you know, I've got a pretty broad range of kind of a startup industry, um, the old fashioned industries like commodities and, you know, investment banks, which are kind of used, used to and somewhat could say bleeding edge. Um, I think if you look at newer technology today, um, one is getting more complicated. That's and two, you know, a lot of it revolves around data. Um, and data is kind of a, you know, a word a lot of people use, but data itself, if you collect lots of data, it's complicated. I mean, you get data from lots and lots of different places um, and it may be your own data. It may be market data. You know, we're doing a lot of investigation into things like machine learning and AI. But in order to in order to drive that sort of technology, you need data um, and you know, we talk about later, if you do this yourself or you get a third party, but collecting that data and that mass amount of data takes a lot of knowledge. It takes a lot of uh, technology. Um, it's complicated. Um, and you don't really know what you want to do with it in a lot of cases. And the idea of a data lake and this unstructured um, or unfettered information is really where you've got to start. You want to collect the data. You don't really want to structure it because that kind of predefines what you want to do with it. But in today's model, um, you want to collect lots of data. You want to put it somewhere and you want to think about how you want to use it later. Um, and Data Lake is really that notion of collecting lots and lots of data, putting it somewhere and then using it um, you know, to your advantage. And when I say your advantage, 
there's lots of business models, lots of business ideas where analyzing data can give you a competitive edge, can give you pricing information, can give you trading, um, settlements information, but it's pretty valuable. But as we'll talk about in a minute, it's not easy, it's complicated, and I think a lot of companies need help in terms of understanding how to use it. So that's kind of how I see it, certainly from our perspective. Great. Um, uh, Carl, how, how, well, how do you see things and, and where are you coming from? And then after that, Rajesh, uh, I didn't give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Apologies. So please uh, do that after Carl's finished. Thanks. Nice to meet everybody. I'm, I'm Carl. I'm Chief Technology Officer at BGSS. Uh, I've, I've come from a background building distributed systems, data lakes, for the, uh, and uh, for a lot, a lot of different types of data for, for the majority of my career uh, and now work at BGSS and we're uh, uh, an IT consultancy based uh, across the globe and, and have a predominant footprint in the UK. So um, I guess we, we touched on what the data lake is from a technology point of view. I think there's also a conceptual point of view that's really important. It's kind of like a platform and a service to your business that enables the realization of value or you to start realizing value. And I think that the concept of it is potentially more important than the technology side of it itself. I think when you talk about why you should be interested in the data lake, Barry just touched on a little bit of there. Uh, it, you know, he's touched on expedite onboarding, time to value, that kind of thing. But he also mentioned AI and machine learning. I think if I look at some of the organizations I worked with some time ago who are doing this as the early adopters, and you see where they are now, they're they're turning machine learning development into a factory line. You know, they're creating 20 models at a time. They've got huge teams capable of doing it. They can spin up the capability in two months to do something in production from experiment. You know, that's versus when you start your journey of taking a, a potentially a year and a half to get to that point. That's the real holy grail you talk of, of land, getting to. And that that platform, that data lake platform and what that drives and the behavior of the people around it and the management of the data that is a central linchpin to be able to get to here in five years time. So you start now, maybe five years time, you're also doing machine learning as a factory line. Okay, Rajesh. Rajesh. Sure, sure thing, Tom. Thanks very much. Um, well, can I just say, it's, uh, it's just a pleasure to be here with, with Barry and Carl and such great organizations like Concord and BJSS as well. Um, you probably know Digitaire, uh, 21 years of professional services consultancy. Uh, creating big data engineering projects like data lakes, but also rescuing data lake projects as well and turning them into uh, valuable data. We can go into things uh, that could come to clinical case studies a bit later. I introduce myself, uh, I am the CTO of Digitair and uh, yeah, uh, effectively running across all the projects we have. Uh, so commodities, energy trading, a lot in financial services as well. Um, but yeah, back to, back to topic. Um, I, uh, definitely reflect on everything that Carl said and what Salema was saying slightly earlier this morning as well uh, in terms of it's okay to have the moonshots, but you've got to make sure you've got the right rocket first. And um, additionally, understanding the journey and the people aspect of it as well. So even though we're talking about technology, it's really about the people side. Uh, so essentially going, walking into that and thinking about you know, you hear about the five V's of data as well. So, you know, the volume and generally data lakes do give you volume. So that's the first thing that you, you think about and the variety. So various different data sources that you can ingest, but that's kind of similar to, to uh, structured data as well. But then you have things like uh, velocity, which suddenly you, you may not necessarily go for, towards data lake patterns when you have things like real-time systems. Um, but then veracity is understanding the quality of data. And that's where sometimes you find uh, data swamps. And you might hear things like data lakes turning to data swamps. Uh, one of my consultants uh, often quotes a South Park episode where there is phase one, uh, collect all the data, phase three, profit. And in the middle, phase two, big question mark. So exactly what Carl was talking about earlier as well, understanding that there is a bit of a timeline to that journey. Um, and then an organizational shift as well, because the word he used be was behaviors. And exactly what Salema said earlier as well, behavioral changes. Uh, you may need data scientists, you may need data custodians, people that can make sense of the data and extract the value out of those things as well. Um, and that brings us to the final V, which was which is value. Um, not losing sight of that because you're probably familiar with, and I know certainly as an organization we are, of a whole bunch of companies out there who've started uh, a centralized data project and it may be called various names, you're probably thinking of one now. And then it becomes that the project itself or the platform itself is the end 
to itself rather than the the value that it's going to bring. So yeah, keeping an eye on that business value at all times. Right. More. Well, I mean, I think actually that's a nice um, segue into the uh, sort of the prerequisites. I mean, Barry, I mean, what what do you think the prerequisites for implementing data lakes in terms of the skills and the, the data structures, et cetera, which uh, Rajesh was touching upon there? Well, I mean, you know, as I mentioned before, we do, we started doing quite a lot of machine learning and therefore, you know, I suppose by definition, we need a lot of data to feed into our machine learning, um, I'd say experiments. I suppose it's gone a bit further than experiment at the moment, but, you know, we've done, we've gone, we've moved quite, quite uh, fast and um, furiously forward on that. Um, I think, you know, I, I decided very early on, we did not have the skill set to build our own data lake. I mean, I think, you know, I, I think it's not, you know, some people think, well, it's just, you know, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a SQL database. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's a database of data. Let's just, you know, you know, set up a, a SQL database and put it in. It's not, you know, it's clear, you know, I mean, I might be stating the obvious to people who know this, but it's not that. Um, and, you know, you need data scientists, you need people with a particular skill set, which we don't have. You know, we're a small company, as I, I, I don't know if I mentioned, you know, we're only five years old with 60 employees and we certainly out of 60 employees do not have data scientists so we decided very early on that you know we needed help from an external company who knows how to do this um and that's been very fortuitous because we don't have to think too much detail around how to set these things up we go from expertise that they have um so i think in terms of skill sets I think companies need to think very hard around if they really have the skill set, because unless you've done this sort of thing before, it's not that straightforward and it's not setting up a database and it's not setting up a data warehouse. It's not all the older terms that people have used. Um, so, so you just need to sort of do a quick health check to see if your company actually is in a position to even attempt implementing well it. i think so i think you need to i need to you need to check i mean some people it doesn't i can't talk for other companies but i've heard other companies say yeah we know how to do this and six months a year later actually suddenly find out they don't so i think some initial explore exploratory um investigation is fine i think talking to companies and you know around how to do this is useful and then finding out what you want what you want to use it for because and how you collect data i've I talked on, on, on other sessions around don't underestimate where you need to get the data from and how to get it, because that's also pretty difficult. Right, so, right. So obtain the data you want, unstructured, it's not that straightforward. And I would, you know, I would challenge most companies to say, actually, you probably would not be that successful if you'd never done it before. Thank you, thank you. I mean, Carl, Carl, what do, what do you think about that? I mean, where, where do you start? Are you fit to start and... Uh... Yeah, you've, you've certainly got to assess uh, your situation. I think it's a really, really good point. That is, it is a complex thing. Uh, actually, over recent years, it's become tech, technologically a lot simpler and actually operationally from the technology side a lot simpler, but it's still a complex thing to, to, to deploy and develop. So uh, I think there's a number of prere prerequisites. One is an absolutely bought in business at senior levels, you know, um, organizations with chief data officers, et cetera, that have, um, you know, that position and that, 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 um, ability to set proper strategy and have it followed by a whole organization is super important. We see that make a massive change. Um, attitude, you know, value first attitude. It's not just an IT project. Don't think about data lakes as an IT solution or a technology project alone. Uh, the, your attitude towards uh, applying DevOps principles to, the, to, to this kind of delivery service led approach. Skills are critical, right? Data skills and not just any data skills experience having done it before and done it right before. A lot of people have picked up this stuff as software engineers, software architects, and there is no problem. I came from that background as well. But you, you learned that first time and then you got a load of experience and you did it better and better. Having the people who have done this before and done it right before uh, is, is really important. I think, in fact, in the, the blurb at the beginning, you talk about the you know, a fail, high failure rate of these kind of things. Well, don't pick people who have necessarily failed lots of times before. Um, uh, yeah, and I think that's some of some of the main some of the main things. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, uh, we've got a couple of uh, questions that have actually come in, so they're quite uh, typical here. So I mean, I'll open this to 
to to to anyone who, who fancies answering this. So in terms of um, you know, how would you say that a company could implement a data lake technology to be used as a company like Oracle of Sorts, meaning a data repository that could quickly uh, quarry for any type of information like forex prices received for an API or something like this. It seems to be quite a technical question there. Anyone want to have a bash at that? Well, the question says, would you say that a company could implement a data lake technology to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's important is, is then how, how you model manage that data, how you ensure that everybody can understand it in a single language, what query capability or technologies you put on top of that. Are you talking about natural language query? Are you talking about people who are used to querying data and understanding it? Are you talking about BI? So the answer is yes, absolutely. But then the, 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 it raises a hundred other questions about how you'd yeah. actually go about doing that. The, the, yeah, there's actually one question here as well, which I think sort of leads into something which we, we want to sort of uh, discuss anyway, in terms of the skill sets. I mean, going back, uh, Rajesh, there, there's a question here. There was a mention, of course, having the right skill set to build a data lake. I mean, uh, how important is the skill set of a data architect is the question, um, providing logical understanding of the data compared to, say, a data engineer that focuses on the implementation side of things? Yes, um, there's a whole bunch of skill sets that may be involved. So data engineering, data, data architecture, um, so understanding the right paradigm. So a data architect may actually uh, put that into place, data engineering as well to make the whole platform a success. Um, but then if you're thinking about the, the value points we mentioned earlier as well, so business anal analysts, you know, system analysts, you may be able to look at the data because um, the real, the core benefit around the data lake over things like data warehouses and data marts is the ability to source relationships around different silos of data that normally may not have come together. That's the real, the real core benefit I'd see. Um, I think Stavros's question has kind of disappeared off the screen, but what Stavros was, met, was talking about earlier was around um, an oracle of sorts. But one of the things I would, I would ask Stavros is, you, know, you, you mentioned right at the end, this Forex price is received uh, API, and I'd start there. You know, I'd start with that. You know, I think about that carefully and all the non-functional requirements around that as well. So how responsive do you want that to be? As former head of uh, foreign exchange technology for, for a large bank a while back, um, are you thinking about micro, are you think about millis, are you think about nanos in terms of that data? Um, once understanding that will give you a good insight as to whether a lake type pattern and any of the various type of technologies that could support that could be useful. You're seeing a lot of, um, so a lot of Hadoop type uh, platforms that were there previously and now essentially more snowflake type platforms where you've got this kind of hybrid of structured and unstructured. So you can put your foot on both worlds there. Um, so yeah, I think a few things to consider. I think a few different data sets, I, definitely around the skill sets, I would say around the business analysis and system analysis as well. Uh, and yes, it's great to bring in external skills to bring the platform, but, but you know, keeping the IP close to yourselves, you know, every, everyone on the client side, you, you know your business, you know your organization and you know the data that you need and will make your life a lot easier. So um, you know, creating the technology that, that benefits your day-to-day your -day lives, really, that's it. That's great. I mean, and Barry, do you want to pick up on that uh, yeah. as well? As well as well, let me let me uh, let me segment it a little bit, and in some ways, let me over. I like to oversimplify things sometimes, which is there's a technology component. So we talked about that. So you know the technologists that you need to help you put this platform together. But in my view, it's not just that. You know, we talk about data scientists, and some people think, are they technology people or are they business people? But the reality is. There's a technology component that gets your data late, gets all the data in there. It's what you do with that data once you've got it. And how do you, I think Rajesh mentioned it, how do you look for patterns that connect that data together? That's actually in some ways the, the magic source to some extent, which is let's assume you've got the data lake set up. Yeah, what do yeah. you do with the data? To, to add to that, because there's a question here from the audience about how data lake and machine learning helps futures trading. And I know right. we've been doing a lot of that sort of- so We've been looking at something yeah. similar to that, which is, okay, we've got the data now, what can we imply from that data? And that to me is, you know, is kind of the, I say the, the, the secret source or the magic source or the, or, or, you know, the, the, the utopian trail or panacea, if you like, which is, You've got the data, what can you imply from that data? 
Um, and people call them data scientists, and it's true. You know, what algorithmic stuff can you put on top of that? That's pretty important um, because that's, I think, is the real value that companies can get out of it, which is, you know, you can call it, you know, prediction of prices, if you like, of commodities prices. That's what you want to use it for. Um, um, and you can predict, you know, what trade you may do in the future, if you like. Um, but to me, that's where the value really comes to the forefront on the business side. So I think there are two sides, a technical side, which I don't want to belittle that because that is pretty important. But what, how you use that data and the business value you get out of it is, is just as important. Um, Carl, do you want anyth anything back to you on that in terms of sort of the, the how, how this is actually from a commodity trading perspective? You know, how, is, how do you see this helping the industry already and maybe possibly in the future? So... I'll preface this with I'm not, I, I'm actually, I work across a lot of industries and commodities is only one of those that I see, but um, I worked with an organization that gives an example of this previously. So uh, they were, they were looking at, so they had existing models, they ran them, um, it took a very long time, they ran them often in Excel, etc, to predict yields from crops effectively all over, all over the world. Um, and they'd use that as, you know, to make trading decisions on, of course. Uh, what, what we did, what you could do there is that not, not just the extra amount of data you can put into a data lake, but the, the processing power that comes with a distributed system like that as well. So by spreading it across a lot of machines and bringing in you know, billions of rows of weather data from absolutely everywhere across the world, we were able to run uh, algorithms that took 10, 10, 10 hours potentially previously in a matter of uh, seconds and minutes across many machines and run them many times over, predicting to a far finer grain the return, as well as across the globe, not just in one area at a time. And clearly that makes step change to what, what's possible. So looking at, for me, it's about uh, when you're delivering a data lake as well, it's not, I, I know it's an underpinning technology and underpinning set of capabilities and change, et cetera, but you've got to be thinking about value and return on investment and what you're actually going to do with it from stage one. If, and and be impatient about getting that value out of it too. Rajesh, I'm not choosing you because you're impatient or anything, but impatience and, and how to, <laughs> what, do you, what do you reckon in terms of all of this? Oh, I remember being patient, Tom. I think it was in the 1990s <laughs> and then Google happened. Um, the uh, information that you think Carl starts using up all the bandwidth with his weather <laughs> modeling and then my, you know, everything starts uh, crashing, right? But, uh, Absolutely. Um, no, I, I would I would echo that as well. Um, I think the the main thing really is understanding what is the use of that data and how responsive you want it to be as well. Um, it's becoming a lot faster now to get really great analytics and great reporting. If we just step back a little bit and think about where did data lakes you know start really coming to, into prevalence was really around. Uh, someone's in financial services about 10, 15 years ago, uh, we're seeing a lot of regulatory reporting needs, you know, um, like MIFID II and others, MADMA, market abuse regulations. And it was really interesting for clients to, to take all their data sets together, bring them together without having to worry about that one project where, you know, someone's got a spreadsheet and a taxonomy and 53 different versions. And, oh, this is gonna be, it's gonna be right this time around, you know, we'll get the schema correct. And then we can bring everything together, get all the relationships, and then we'll do the reporting that we need. Of course, that never really happens. So they shifted to this whole schema on demand model, which was the, the data lake. Um, but with that comes a few challenges, but you can still see the insight and to answer some of the questions that came up earlier, um, it's really around the market data that you can put inside there as well. Uh, transactional data, really, that's for reporting and analytics. Uh, the real timeness of data, I would probably say look elsewhere, um, especially for things that you need real time trading. The reference data aspect, fantastic. Yeah, sure, you can do that. The static data, that's great. Um, but when it comes down to real time market data that you need to take from an exchange and then put into pricing, perhaps, perhaps not a good choice for that. So there's a few patterns and anti patterns around that choice as well. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Hey, Barry, we've actually got a question here on, on how much power is required. <laughs> Yes. Are we talking about Star Trek stuff here? Or, you know, <laughs> well, I, and, uh, yeah. I can only talk about what, what we've done. So I can talk, you know, in real terms about what we've done. And, you know, are we, are we, are the light bulbs dimming in the office sort of thing? Um, we basically use AWS for our data lake and does not cost us a lot of money all of the time to run, to be honest. So, 
Uh, it's it's nothing like the blockchain mining for cryptocurrencies. It's really, to be quite honest, it's cheap. <laughs> if you get it set up right, it's not expensive. You're not having to build your own hydro power station somewhere. No, yet. no. We, 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 you know, we, as I say, the light bulbs are not dimming, and we're not. Uh, it's not costing us more. You know, more than our, our any any other trading system we've got. So it's not expensive, to be honest, uh, in terms of what we're doing. Um, and we're doing pretty advanced, well, I think it is. And we were doing pretty advanced, you know, algorithms and analytics in terms of price prediction, um, mm. you know, before the market opens. So, you know, I think it's fairly advanced stuff. Um, and it runs, I think, you know, other colleagues have said it, it runs pretty quick. I'm amazed how quick some of this stuff runs, to be quite honest. You know, the amount of calculations it's doing, you know, it takes, you know, I wouldn't say it's seconds, but in terms of what we're doing, but I think it takes something like 15 to 20 minutes, which to me, in terms of what we're trying to do is pretty good. Yeah, well, I think that links back to Carl's earlier point about the fact that it's just so much easier to do these things. And you yeah. know, I've seen uh, a lot of stuff, even advanced machine learning stuff, where you can use one of these online services. And there's a lot of the modeling, a lot of the machine learning code, it's well, already there. You know, I think I think that's true. I mean, I think as technology, as all as all of us know, I mean, the amount of technology you can get off the shelf, or you know, the toolkit you get, you can you can get now. I mean, advanced over the last five, ten, fifteen years. I mean, it's, it's amazing what you can get um, these days. Um, it's just, as I said before, it, it's really from a business point of view, it's understanding what you want to achieve and how you how you get information from the data you collect. But the toolkit and the technology available is 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 is, is unbelievably great these days. Mm. So, uh, Rajesh, I mean, uh, is there an alternative if you don't want to build a big data lake in your backyard if you don't have the space for it? Uh, everything subject to planning permission is what I'm finding out. <laughs> <laughs> recently um <laughs> the um it, and that's not a bad uh bad way of putting it to be honest as well because it comes down to what your requirements are and the constraints that you're dealing with as well so uh many alternatives to, to data lakes um so there's nothing wrong with some of the classic architectures as well depending on your requirements you know so you know don't dismiss those out of hands you know i mean a great Barry's talking about a SQL database, right? So if you've got something that's really structured and really, um, you know, a, a small, uh, small service, microservice, a small platform that that's always requires, then, then fair enough. Um, but, but I think I guess for, for this, we're talking about you know large vats of value. You know, we're unlocking a lot of value here, and we're talking about multiple data sets. You know, and we're talking about an alternative to centralized data stores. Um, probably unstructured data, but maybe structured as well, because as soon as you bring all these data engineers, data scientists, uh, business analysts, and they're, they're quickly uh, finding relationships, they're, they're creating hypotheses and understanding where these, these different data fields can be used. So um, you, you quickly go into a, an area of structured and unstructured data as well. Um, one of the patterns that's coming into to vogue now, it's something that's been around for a while, but it's just got a, a new moniker. Um, it's called a data mesh pattern. So it's a bit of a hybrid approach. So, you know, looking at point to point connectivity across various different um, data structures. Um, and so a good way of thinking about this would be you decentralize the data storage, you're decentralizing that, because the lake is a centralized store, just like a warehouse. You are decentralizing the storage, you're, you're now embracing point-to-point -point connectivity, which was kind of seen as an anti-pattern uh, in the last, say, last few years. Um, and then you're centralizing the registry, you're centralizing the directory. It's almost like having a phone book and saying, okay, well, I actually need uh, this weather data or this forecasting data or this, this market data, and that's, that's where I go, and having various services around the periphery. Um, and with that, you, you, generally your time to market is, is a lot faster um, because otherwise you, you create this brand new platform and you need to get all the skill sets in place as well, as well as being reasonably independent as an organization as well. Great to have all these supporting structures come in and having all these skill sets, but then you want to be able to maintain this platform. You want to live with that extension in your garden, right? Um, onto the builders have left, right? So um, I, think, I think that's one of the things I would say, yeah, effectively looking at uh, various different kind of other structures as well, and and perhaps you know rejecting some of the anti patterns from 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 uh, from previous okay. as well. Yeah, I mean, Carl, uh, we'd like to to add, to add something to that in terms of because um, I think you mentioned about the, the it's much easier to 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 do things. 
Um, and I think also maybe that could lead into, if you wanted to touch upon the question we just had in terms of what do you do if you don't have the proper skill sets in house? Sure, I think I'll probably go to the question because uh, I just gave a, a pretty pretty full quite a full answer to the last one, and I, I don't think I've got a massive. In fact, data mesh is, is one of the areas I, I, I you know I think of in, in that space as well. So I'm not I probably won't won't add much more to that. However, what do you do if you have the proper get, sets of skills? Well, if I was a salesperson, I said, please call us; we'll be happy to help. However, the the, the, the truth is, you, you, obviously, there are loads of organisations out there who can who can help you either uh, bring your skills on, um, bring people in to, to support you. But at the end of the day, the goal is that you build, may well be, may not be in all cases, but you want to build some capability and skills in-house as well. Um, you know, outside organizations can help do that um, then, but you also have to consider about operating these platforms. Even once you've built them, they are, they, they, they do take some real skill and expertise to be able to operate live effectively for a period of time so you know there's options around manage do you do you look to a managed service cloud has alleviated a lot of these difficulties with operationalizing things in fact now i probably wouldn't recommend anybody starts a data lake project that isn't cloud native um it's really made that level of change to how easy it is to operate or how difficult it is to operate these things but um Obviously, the, the other options are, are start small, um, higher in the skills. That is difficult. There is a tough skills market at the moment, especially right now. The, the job market in this space is very difficult. Um, but yeah, lots of options. I'm sure others would, would, would have other views on that as well. Yeah, I was just wondering, I mean, at the, uh, the beginning of the session, we, we actually asked them uh, a poll. We brought a poll up. I don't know if... Um... We could, if there's any results from the poll that we could bring up on the, on the screens. Um, if that's possible, I'm looking at the the, the main screens here. But uh, so, so can we? Well, the data lake's not working for this poll. Can we bring up the poll? <laughs> can you hear me? Okay. Well, while we're waiting for the results of the the, the poll there to, uh, to to chat about, because uh, I'm looking at the the, the streaming here. Um, in terms of um, someone mentioned about sort of regulatory pressures um, earlier, I mean um, maybe that's something we should touch upon because you know I'm certainly uh, not fully aware. You know, sitting in Asia, you know, what are the regulatory pressures uh, around the world in Europe, etc., for building these uh, uh, these data lakes or how they are managed? I mean, there's huge amounts of uh, uh, regulatory stuff coming in in terms of the managing of people's data. So I guess it depends what you're in. Ah, okay, so, so um, maybe you wanna to touch upon that and we've just got some of the, 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 the polls here as well. So we can look at that in a second. Anyone, anyone want to pick up a little bit on the regulatory side that anything that people are seeing in terms of stuff that could impact how we manage or implement our data lakes? I guess it depends which- uh, Well, I mean, I, I don't, I don't see much about it. Interestingly enough, I, I'm not sure if it's on subject or off subject, but I know in terms of collecting data and more around personal, like personal data is a big issue, right? I mean, I, I, I don't, we're not collecting personal data in terms of the analysis we're doing, but certainly there's lots of noise and regulation around people analyzing uh, personal data. I mean, we only have to look at things like Facebook and things that are going on there. So I think... <clears throat> I think, unfortunately, uh, and I say unfortunately for the following reason, I think there will start to be regulation around data lakes, AI, machine learning, predominant because the likes of Facebook, <clears throat> um, uh, Twitter and whatever, are creating their own data lakes with personal data. So I think we'll see some noise around that. I'm not sure, certainly we haven't seen, but you know the other... Uh, the others on the panel might have more insight in it. We haven't really seen any regulatory pressure yet, at least, in terms yeah. of anything on data lakes, in terms, of, in terms of data we're getting. I mean, outside of, you know, the whole market data issue of what you use market data for, how you're collecting it, who's looking at it, that whole, whole issue, which is nothing to do with data lakes. That's just the whole issue of, you know, if you if you what you're using, you know, market data for that sort of thing, but that's a whole different that's a whole different subject. We have to yeah have to look at sort of the whole data usage policies and lining it up with yeah, our that, that's department. right, and uh, you know that's a that's, that's yeah. a that's a whole different ball game, <laughs> a whole different discussion. 
is, I don't know if the panel would agree. I mean, is it good to sort of get, if you have, uh, if you're a regulated entity, to get your compliance people involved, even if it's just to listen in uh, on things so that it's not a big surprise as to what data you're using, how you're managing it, and things like that, potentially? Yeah, I'd say so, Tom. I think it goes back to, to the point that, that Carl made earlier about a data strategy, maybe a data officer as well. So um, having that North Star, having that clear vision for the organization as to what data it needs, the level of data maturity it currently uh, enjoys and where it would like to be as well. Um, and with that comes the, the kind of behaviors and mindsets that you use around data as well, because um, it just like just like that extension, it can quickly become quite untidy if it's uh, if it's not looked after. Um, right. and similarly, can any data structure as well. So I say, yeah, in terms of uh, one regulation, obviously uh, there's there's two aspects of this. Obviously, data lakes uh, answer the regulations by take collecting all the data, and then you can, you can pull out to all the regulatory bodies. Um, and then obviously there's the regulation around what data that you have internally. So that's that, that different uh, mm -hmm. uh, different way of looking at it. Um, and with that, obviously having that great data strategy and then every, uh, and being and having that transparent to the entire organization as well. It's not just a, a single person responsibility. You know, it's it's the entire organization to, to make sure that if they do come across something that's personally identifiable as Barry was talking about, it gets reported, it gets cleansed, and the data that's being used is um, is safe for everybody. Carl, you got anything to, to to add on that? Maybe I mean, should we have our sort of steering committee, almost like a very clear mission statement, sort of take a very take a lot of a, a deep breath and a pause to properly scope out before we jump into the data lake? Uh, sorry, I had to get that in there. <laughs> no, did not jump into the data lake? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I just don't know what to, how to follow that. The, the, uh, the, uh, yes, I'm not a big fan of spending loads and loads of time doing everything up front. What I will say is pull everything left. So as you're doing the delivery, involve compliance people, involve security, bring it into the team, bring, make it part of it. I'm a big believer in DevSecOps. I'm a big believer in, in, in making sure you pull all that into the process. Uh, get, that gets those people on board as well. They understand the solution. They understand the the, the ways in which you're making it compliant or, or you're making it secure. So, brilliant. Uh, well, we've managed the, we got a, we we got data on a few. We, we ended up with a massive data lake in the chat room there for a few other polls, including our own. Um, but drawing from the data lake here, we can see that have you implemented a data lake? So the audience, uh, we've got a nice big audience, and they said yes, twenty four percent have, fifty three percent no. 24% aren't really sure if they have a data lake. So maybe, so hopefully not a data leak, but yeah, I'm sure there. And, and then also, did you get external help to implement a data lake? 20% yes, 53% no, and unsure 27%. So there you go. So there's still a lot of scope out there, a lot of people who have not jumped into the, the data lake uh, side of things there yet. But uh, and I think that it's quite interesting. So I think in the commodity industry, we're, we're just, uh, would you agree with my statement that, you know, we're just touching the surface in terms of, you know, there's a lot of data we don't even realize has value, you know, um, in our organization because we just haven't had something look, machine learning or, or something look at the data. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed, Tom. I mean, there's a, there's a saying, I think, especially the last few years, where they say data is the new oil. I think, as I just said, we prefer to say data is the new water, try to be a bit more sustainable, get our ESG score up as well. Um, uh, but effectively, there's a, there's a lot of, it's, it's a natural resource and there's a lot of value to it as well. So once, but at the same time, it being a natural resource, it does need a lot of looking after, a lot of care as well. Okay. Well, I think, you know, we're coming very close to the end of the, of this panel session. Barry, any quick last sort of comments there? Um, actually, I was quite interested in the, in the results of the survey. Um, mm. I don't know if, I don't know if we thought 24, was it 24% of people have implemented data lakes? That's a bit higher than I thought actually. And the, I think you said 50% did it themselves. That's much higher than I thought it would be. But um, I suppose what we haven't really asked is what they're using it for. So, um, you know, maybe maybe some of them are simple, some of them quite advanced, but that's an interesting statistic. Um, especially when I think the commodities are one of the more older fashion industries, it tends to be a little bit further behind, um, you know, other industries. But that's interesting. Um, the other thing I'd finish with is, 
you know, I, I think Rajesh says, and I think other people have mentioned, you know, data's a new water, oil, Coca-Cola, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that is true. Um, and I think people, one, don't get value out of their own data. And I think companies still struggle to get access to their own data. I mean, we talk about data lakes, which is, you know, in some ways the advancing technology. But I'm always surprised how many people can't even get access to their own trade data out of their own trade systems or, you know, some of the finance systems. Um, I'm always surprised by that. Um, so I think there's a way to go. But I think people will realize that data really is important to them. And the more they get access to it, the more they can, you know, tie things together in terms of meaning of various data. I think I think it's a it's a you know a strategic or, or advantage for companies if they get uh, a lead on that. Right. Thank you, uh, Rajesh. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's there's a lot of potential there as well. I guess the, the question I would add to the poll would be, did you get the value that you thought you would get when you implemented it? That's the question I would. And if, if any brave participants, if you if you feel like putting something in the comments there. Um, just, you know, yes, no, maybe, you know, between one and five in terms of value. Um, and that's the one of the things I would say. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing around projects as well and platforms that they seem to get a little bit off course. Uh, Tom, you talk about data locks as well, and they can just get, get, bit, just get that little bit messy, can't they? So, yeah, effectively, the, the roles and responsibilities around. around that's right. Yeah. Carl, anything? Any last comments there? Yeah, the final thing I take away from the polls is those 24% that have said yes, from what I've seen, many of them will be doing it again. Um, there's the, not, in a, not in a bad way that you learn a lot from building a data lake. You may mature it, you may change it over time, but with the transition to cloud and all that offers and um, you know, some of the systems that were maybe on-prem Hadoop instances, things like that, mm. those, uh, you know, you may go through this process again and, and uh, you'll have really, really valuable learnings from that first time around to do that. Well, that, that's brilliant. Well, I mean, uh, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Uh, the time has flown past, so we have to close the session here. We ran over just a little bit there, but it's very, very interesting. Barry, Rajesh, Carl, thank you so much indeed uh, for the session this afternoon, and uh, thank you very much indeed.